the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. That tonight we're very blessed to have our Lord and you keep us with us. Give us the humble. This thing is a bit tall for me. <laughs> So it's like uh, halfway through the name of the Father, It's like halfway through the week, just about. And uh, I think if you're paying attention, you understand why the nickname of the week is Passion Week, because it definitely gets more passionate as the week goes by. The story gets more remarkable with every day. It gets more romantic. It gets more dramatic. And it's really something else, especially today. It's really quite something else. It's really moving. It's like as if you're watching a sitcom, but it's real. And I mean, it, it almost seems like fiction, but you can't make up it, the story. It's just so amazing. Um, I mean, if you think about Christ is the heroine, the son of God, and he has with him his band of helpers, his heroes, his 12 disciples. And yet there's betrayal. And yet they are... Their faith in him is almost waning, and he keeps saying he's not going to make it, he's going to die, and they don't understand, and it's, it's a very dramatic story. It's got everything you could want, politics, scandal, love, culture, clashing, it's got everything that you'd want. And the message overall for the week is Pesca, you know, meaning Passover and going from death into life. And so you kind of wonder, today... What piece are we going to learn about this passage from death into life? And I'm only going to make just one point, and I'll explain it for a long time, or not a long time, a pretty brief period of time. But it's just one point, and it's kind of difficult. So that's why we're just going to focus on one thing. And I'll say it in a churchy sort of way, and I'll say it in like a, a more modern sort of way. Basically, the point of today's talk, I'm just going to give it to you, is matanya. Or, you know, making a change is changing your outlook. It's changing your mindset. What does the word matanya mean? This is interactive. If I was a priest, I wouldn't let you speak. <laughs> what does matanya mean? Close, good. We do the matanya, and that means we bow down. What else? What does the actual Greek word matanya mean? Or metanoia? Very good, repentance. But literally, what does the word mean? Matanya is repentance. But what does the word, the literal definition, translation? Very good. Change directions. And repentance really is, it's not just stopping the bad habit, but it's moving in the other direction. It's changing. It's changing directions. And so that's what this is all about. We're changing death into life. And... A lot of times we think that we don't have control over our changes. So, for example, we don't have control over how motivated we are or our emotions or our feelings or why we do what we do. We kind of feel like it's not really something that I have control over. Like you hear all the time, you made me angry. You did this to me. If it wasn't for you, I'd be happy as a clam. Or I'm so happy because uh, my fiance did this for me or did that for me or this circumstance ha it happened, so now I'm at peace. And we sort of relegate our own emotions and our mental state to something outside of ourselves, as if the outside world has the effect uh, of changing who we are. Does that make sense? Especially, you know, I hear it from my wife all the time, oh, you made me so angry, you did this and this and this. And I tell her, well, no, actually, it's your choice to be angry. It <laughs> doesn't go over very well. But it's the truth. <laughs> but it's true. It doesn't really fly. You have the choice to be happy, at peace, or angry and mad. It's up to you. You have that free will to choose those things. And it, it comes from God giving us these two gifts, the gift of life and the gift of free will. And from those things comes from, come salvation. And I'm going to give you two examples of how this is true. One biblically and one a little bit more modern. Biblically, 
The example is St. Paul talks about this over and over again. He says in Hebrews, be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he said, be content with anything that you have, with such things that you, as you have. And then he says it again. I think this is uh, Philippians. I didn't write it down, but I think this is Philippians. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through who strengthens me. Again, in every circumstance, he has learned to be satisfied, satiated, satiated, content. In whatever, he can be content. I take pleasure, in 2 Corinthians he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He takes pleasure in infirmities. Coming from St. Paul, and we all remember all the infirmities that he's, he actually he told us his infirmities. He said, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep. That means he was floating in the open ocean a night and a day. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in cities, in wilderness, in sea, amongst false brethren, weariness, toil, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, fasting, cold, and naked. He was in all those things, and yet he says, I have learned in all things to be content. He is satisfied. That is the type of control that we should be having over our own minds, over our own emotions. And I think sometimes we look at the readings of the Bible or we look at the church and look at these saints like St. Paul and we're like, okay, but he's a saint. That's kind of far away from where I am. I'm definitely not like that. Like I flip a switch and I just get upset. Or, you know, I can't get rid of this nagging feeling of uh, wanting more, of needing more. Or I know that, you know, I know that's what you say, but if I just had a little bit more money, everything would go so much more smoothly. But you do have control over these things. I'll give you a, a more modern example, a story that I heard this week, a true story. By the way, this is a, there's a really good book called Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives by um, Elder Tadeus of Batavnica. It's a very nice book. It touches upon the subject. But a more modern example. Okay. Some guy was, um, they had to move their car uh, because of street cleaning. And so they forgot. And at midnight, his wife woke him up and said, you got to move your car. And he said, no, you do it. So the wife got up, turned the car on, and moved it. And then she had to, like, move cars, he said. So she had to switch cars. She turned the engine off, went to the other car to, you know, like, switch cars, etc. And then she went back to the first car. The battery died. So she's like, oh, my job is done. She went upstairs, told her husband, it's 1 a.m. And so her husband goes downstairs. And he's got one of those Costco things, like a battery jumper that you get. And uh, he tries to jump start the car for an hour. But apparently those things don't work if the car is like really, really dead. It's like if it's just barely, you know, like not squeaking, then it can work. So he tried for an hour. He couldn't make it work. So after an hour, it's like 2 a.m., he calls AAA. AAA says uh, it'll take about 30 minutes. We'll send you a text message. The dispatch will be on his way. He hangs up the phone with AAA, and he gets a text message. He tells him he needed a, a jump start for his car. And at this point, he said he decided he would pray. He decided he would say, God, you know, just make this easier. It's Holy Week. Make it easier for me. I, I, need, I have work tomorrow, and uh, the kid's not sleeping, and it's just going to be a really long day if this takes forever. Just, can't you just start the car? And so anyways, he said his prayer. He asked for St. George's help. He asked for St. Mary's help, and he waited. After an hour, AAA didn't come. So he called AAA again, and they said, oh, I don't know what happened. You know what? Let me check on this. Somebody's going to call you. And so they hang up the phone. 20 minutes later, he calls AAA again. They're like, oh, we don't know what happened. You know what? Uh, oh, I see. Here it is. Oh, they switched providers. Somebody else is going to come. If you just wait a few minutes, somebody's going to call you. And at this point, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm staying on the phone with you. Like, figure out what's going to happen right now. He's on hold for 20 minutes. And they're like, 
They get back on the phone, like, did you need a battery? I said, no, I just need a jump start. I said, well, battery service doesn't start till 5 a.m. At this point, it's like 3.30 in the morning, something like that. He said, well, I don't need a battery. I just want somebody to come and jump start. Anybody can come and jump start. And then she puts them on hold. Ten minutes later, she's like, okay, somebody will be there in 15 minutes. They'll call you. And so, true to her word, finally, somebody calls. He said, hey, my name is Angel. I'm uh, coming. I'll be there in 10 minutes to come and jumpstart your car. And then 15 minutes later, the guy comes, jumpstart the car. It took him like 20, 30 minutes because he had also one of those industrial costco size things. It didn't work. But he had jumper cables, and the jumper cables finally worked. Lesson for the day is apparently you should only have jumper cables. Forget about those jump starters. Anyways, the car starts right up. And so the guy is telling me the story, and he's like, isn't that amazing? And he starts crying. The guy telling the story starts crying. I said, what are you crying about? That sounds terrible. And he says, oh, I forgot to tell you. I got a parking ticket, too. Because at 2 in the morning, the parking guys came by and said, I had to move my car. I'm blocking the alley. And they gave me a ticket. I was like, this is a terrible story. First, you have to get rid of your AAA. It's not worth it for you. And then you have to, like, fight this parking ticket. How is this any, any good? He's like, didn't you see the miracle happen? Like, what are you talking about? He's like, I prayed to God that he would just make it go. I said, but it didn't happen. You waited four hours. You got a parking ticket. Like, it's a miserable story. He's like, no, I prayed to God, but he was trying to teach me. I was trying to fit God into fix it the way that I want. But instead, he sent me an angel. And he wanted me to know that it is him that's involved in the story. And he sent a guy named Angel. And of course, in my head, I'm like, it was just his name. It's not that big a deal. Is it really that miraculous? But he is convinced that God is showing him a sign. That he sent his angel to help him. And maybe it wasn't exactly the way that he thought, but God was involved in, in his life. And I think this is the mindset that we need to change. Because that man went back up to his room after four hours in the cold, in the rain, in the alley. And he was happy. He was okay. Because he felt God is involved in even this minuscule part of his life. And that's the way that we need to change our own mindset. Are we able, have you sharpened your conscience so much that you can see God everywhere? Have you softened your heart so that you can see God acting in every part of your life? Because that's what this story is about from today. The readings of Saint uh, or of Mary and of Judas. That's what this story is about, is mindset differences. So, I'll tell you, that's what I want you to do. Now, how to do it, I'll give you like a little brief hint about how you might be able to start this process. Remember the story, you know, this is like a kid's story that they tell in like Jewish preschools and stuff about Elijah in the Old Testament and when he went up the mountain to go and find God, to listen for God's answer. And, they, you know, the preschool teacher sits down with the, the kids and says, and where was God? Was he in that big wind that broke all the rocks? And the kids say, no. Was he in the earthquake? No. Was he in the big fire? No. Was he in the still, small voice? And that's where God is. He's in the very still, small voice. So are you creating the environment where you have the ability to hear God's whispering to you? To see his presence? Are you familiar with what his voice sounds like? Are you putting yourself up on the mountain in the quiet or in your closet alone? waiting and listening, reading his word, being prepared so that way when you see it, it happens. Or are you sort of more inundated constantly with stimulus? Social media, TV, radio, music, work, email. You know, I get like one email, it goes to my desktop, then my laptop, then my, my phone goes off. And then on top of that, sometimes... They'll send me a page as well. So I have like five devices going off at one time. And is that how our lives are all the time? Or do we give some space for quiet? Abuna Isaac once told me that, you know, the world is trying to steal your peace. And it is an active process for you to be peaceful. You have to actually dedicate time. Go in your room for 30 minutes once a week. 
close all the lights, have a candle, natural light in front of an icon, and sit for 30 minutes. Don't say anything. Just wait. Just wait. Just look with adoration and wait. Are you giving yourself the same quiet time to hear God's voice? Or is it always noisy and loud? Or maybe your emotions are always loud. You're always filled with anger, with lust, with energy, with doing, with buying, with selling, with, with elevating, escalating things. You have to make it so that you can have an ability to hear God's voice. Okay. Let's get to the, you know, the stories of today. The biggest one is uh, Judas. And nobody likes to talk about Judas. I think, number one, we don't like to talk about Judas because we kind of all have a little bit of Judas inside of us. So we do things like Judas do. And second, because it's not that pleasant to talk about Judas. I, once, I went to a retreat one time with the Buna Lua, and we actually, he was given the task of talking, giving a sermon about Judas and contrasting him with like St. Peter, I think. And he said, everybody's waiting for him to start, and he said, I'm not going to talk about Judas. <laughs> but a question, why do we think Judas betrayed Okay, very good. That's true. And even St. John in the Gospel says he was in charge of the money box and he said these things because he you know, wanted money. He was stealing. But there's some other reason too. I think this is something that we all do. We all of us want to put God into a certain way that we define him. Judas was actually an extreme zealot. He really was passionate about having the Messiah. Passionate. And he really, really wanted the salvation of Israel. Passionate about it, about Judah. In fact, his name was Judas. It's like, like a nickname for Judah. Like, you know, Miriam and Mary, the same name. So he was really passionate about the kingdom of Judah and that the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah and from the lineage of David. Really, really passionate about it. And what he expected was a king. He wanted the Messiah to be riding on a horse, entering victoriously into the city. But instead, Christ wanted a donkey. And he wanted somebody with a loud voice. And yet, Christ was like, you know, wouldn't even break a reed. And he wanted somebody that was like going to live and, and free them from the reign of the Romans. And he was like, I'm going to die. So he at first was like, this is the Messiah. I see all these things happening. But then it's like, but he's not fitting. This doesn't make any sense. This isn't the Messiah that I, I was expecting. And the last straw was seeing what he did in the house with uh, Mary, the woman who came with the alabaster flask. Culturally at that time, this was not appropriate. This was scandalous what happened. A woman came into a house uninvited, a sinner woman, and then she touched him inappropriately, and he was okay with it? No way. That's not God. No way this is the Messiah. And he went, and he sold him out. I don't think it was just the money, because the money is 30 pieces of silver. Silver is like the equivalent of $20 today. It was God is not fitting. And all of us do the same betrayal. We all know the Sunday school answer, oh, we betray God every time we sin. Yes, it's true. But the betrayal is deeper than that. When God is not fitting into what we think should be, our faith suffers. So, for example, you know, we put our trust in the school board or in the masses or in our modern culture. And all these people, if all these people are doing something, it can't be wrong. It doesn't make sense. Maybe I'm interpreting my God wrong. You know, for example, God, uh, he sanctifies a marriage. He blesses a union of people when they are unified under the sacrament. And they're living a blessed life. But in our society, that's bigoted and, and prejudice. We should expect whatever, no problem. If you want to live with your partner or do this or that, no problem. But we say, oh, you know, if everybody's doing it, you know, like, it's common now. It's, it should be like, it's, it's all right. You know, they're not married. They can, whatever, it's okay. Or if, for example, you have a different view about sexuality or transgenderism, if you express those views... There's no way. And now it's commonplace. And if you don't have the same ideas, then, you know, you must be prejudiced. 
And I think our faith suffers when God doesn't fit. When we want a miracle and he doesn't give it to us, I don't know if he's really there or listening. I didn't, I really, really love this person. I really thought this was, this person would have made me a holy person. We should have been married. It doesn't work out. You get forlorn. You get so, so sad. You, you leave the church for a while. You go looking other places for a partner in your life. You abandon your faith. It's not how it's supposed to be. Another example, you know, we believe that life begins at conception, at the time of conception. In medical society, they say pregnancy starts when the fertilized egg implants on the uterine wall. So they avoid talking about life starts at conception. It is pregnancy begins when there is uh, attachment to the uterine wall. And when you say it that way, that means uh, emergency contraception is okay. It's not an abortive medication. But that's not exactly consistent with Christian worldview. So until we sharpen our conscience, we are rejecting God when we're not like looking at these subjects, when we're trying to fit him into what we think should be. Why does God care about what I do with my body? What does he care? I, why does he want, why do you think God doesn't allow you the free will to control what's happening inside of your body? It sounds very religious. Free will is important. The independence of women is important. But that's not exactly the way that God works. Why does God care who I have an intimate relationship with? Male or female, it doesn't matter. Like, why does he care? Why does he give a care about that? Something like that. No big deal. It's my free will. He gave me that free will. And so we twist God. We try to make him into what we want instead of us changing. You see the difference? Us changing is the bigger part. That's, that's what we're talking about, matanya. Instead of changing God into our worldview, we have to change ourselves to fit into God. We have to have some repentance. We have to change. Okay, how do I know that this was Judah's problem? It's because he had an ubba moment. Uh, moment. What do I mean by ubba? Like, let's say you stub your toe. What's the first thing you say? Ouch, if you're American. What if you're Egyptian? Ah. Oh. What if you're like, uh, you know, my grandma, or what does she say? Right? Or if you're dramatic, something like that, right? You have this sort of like Ubba moment. Like you see something startling, you get, you have painful reaction, and then your subconscious kicks in and you say something. What was Judah's response when, uh, Judas's response when uh, he saw the woman? pouring oil over the head or the feet of Christ. What was his response? What was everybody's response? Yeah. They were shocked. They were dismayed. They were disgusted. And their response was, are you kidding? How can you let this happen? She's touching you. She's touching your feet. Are you kidding? In this culture, I don't know if you guys realize, but in that culture, women were non-citizens. They were, the only way they had any value was if they were married or attached to a household. So they never left their house unless their hair was covered or accompanied by somebody else. Like, they were non-citizens. And then, like, to have a woman who led a non-standard lifestyle go in and touch you, you're unclean. And, and Christ's response was, like, stop bothering her was rebuking the disciples for being dismayed. And by the way, was it Judas or was it all the disciples? And how many Gospels do you read this story? In all four Gospels. And actually, in Matthew, it was not Judas. It was all the disciples that were mentioned. In Mark, it was some of the people were indignant. In Luke, it was Simon the Pharisee. He didn't even say the disciples. It was Simon the Pharisee, probably the one that had the house, that was the one that was thinking. And that's when Christ told him, like, Simon, you know, if you have a person with 500 
a debt of 500 or a debt of 50, and you forgive them both, which one's going to love you more? Right? Do you remember what I'm talking about? And he says, to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. It was only in the Gospel of John that it's actually mentioned Judas, because all of us are actually committing the same thing. When somebody, and actually the way that Judas said it was, why wasn't it given to the poor? And there it is. That's the big sin. And this is what we all do. He was hiding behind his religiosity. And his pride. And as you know, in this week, you know, when Christ came and saved us from all our sins, this is the very first original sin. And this is the one that, that really upsets our Lord Christ. It's that pride. Why wasn't it sold and given to the poor? I know how to deal with this. It should have happened this way. The person should have repented this way. They should have gone to this church. They should have 300 denarii. There's a lot of money and like we could have saved 5,000 people. It doesn't make sense. I know how it should have gone down. And Christ rebuked him. And Christ said, stop bothering. That's what, that's what Judas was trying to say. Was that I know better than you, God. I know how it should happen. I know how this person should be repenting. And you're not doing it the right way, God. You're not doing it the right way, Christ. You should do it my way. But this is the sin that God really, in this week, said no to. For example, this is, this is actually like a rehashing of what he did earlier in the week. When he went into the temple, and what did he do? He threw over the money changers' tables. And he got mad at them and said, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're hypocrites. It's the same thing here. Because here it is, God is in another church, the house of Simon the leper. It's another church, basically. And God chose this church because he wanted it to be a church where it was known as the church of Simon the leper. Because he wants it to be known, this church, this place that I'm at, where you can come find me, is for anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a leper. It doesn't matter if it's the most disgusting, the worst disease that has ever been known to mankind. That's what they thought about leprosy. He wanted to be at that house because he wants it to be known. Anybody can come here. It's safe. And so this woman came in, and it shows you the resiliency of somebody who has actually truly found repentance, who's really made true matanya. They're resilient. She came in with all the eyes of all the men watching her as she came in and gave up everything in front of him. She bowed down, and she broke the alabaster flask kit. You guys know what alabaster, what it is, an alabaster flask? What's alabaster? What material is alabaster? Wood, stone, gems, gold, what is it? Metal? Huh? I couldn't hear you. It's not leather. Good. It's like marble. It's another stone. Very good. And so the way they would do it is they would have these stone jars that would be carved out of a rock, and they'd pour the precious oil. And in this case, it was spikenard. Spikenard comes from the base of the Himalayan mountains. It is extremely expensive. So they basically imported it from India. And extremely expensive. They said 300, at least 300 denarii. That's like the equivalent of like a one year salary. You make one denarii a day back then as income. So it's like a one year salary. And they would pour it into this jar or box and they would seal it with wax. So if you opened it, it was opened. You can't like reseal it again. And for a woman like this to have that, maybe it was an old heirloom from the family. Maybe she'd been saving it for years. Oftentimes they would save it for the day of their wedding and use some of it at their wedding. This is a very, very precious thing to her, maybe to her family, maybe it's been passed down to her. We don't know. And she broke it, came to him, broken herself, and she broke it in front of him. And it must have infused the whole house with that smell. His feet, maybe she poured on his hair. There's different accounts. In some, in some you know, the fathers say there's, you know, there's four different stories of this in all the four Gospels. Maybe it was one person, maybe it was two, maybe it was three different individuals that did this story with the alabaster glass or the cost of oil. I have my own opinion. If I remind me at the end, I'll tell you why I have an opinion about it. 
But she came and gave everything. And you can imagine, at this time in the week, how comforting it was to our Lord Christ to finally see a truly repentant person. He chose not to stay in Jerusalem. He stayed outside of Jerusalem during this Feast of the Tents. And he, he chose to stay in a house that was formerly full of sin and disease. And how awesome he felt to finally say, this is why I'm here. And actually, this story is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen at the end of the week. How do I mean? Um, okay. Christ was crucified and buried in what? Where was he buried? In the tomb. Made out of rock and covered with a stone. And so here we have in this story, at the time of the betrayal by his disciples, that you have at the same time salvation. And who is there at the foot of the cross? Mary's. And this, this woman, in, one, in the Gospel of John, I think it's, she's called Mary. And the church fathers say, maybe she was Mary Magdalene. Another, another one of the stories, maybe it was Mary, the sister of Martha, the brother of Lazarus. And it's the same thing at the foot of the cross. We have salvation happening with the betrayal of his friends, with the betrayal of the disciples, with the betrayal of the people in the church, of Simon the Pharisee. And then we have salvation happening, and the stone of the tomb is removed, it's broken, and the seal is broken, and we have victory over death. And Christ is saying, this is the church that I want. I want this church where we have true repentance. It's for this that I came here, for a woman like that. And so he made sure, he didn't say a lot of words this last week of his life. You know, there's a, a poem by St. Ephraim the Syrian where the word became silent. And he didn't say a lot of things. But when this was happening, he made sure to say, this is not how the church is going to be. This is a church that's not going to be full of pride. It's not going to be full of religiosity. It's going to be filled with true repentance. You are not to judge how a person comes to the church. We have to have this church full of welcome, full of hope, that this woman can come in the midst of all these men and still be saved. So it's a foreshadowing of the salvation that's going to happen. Um, you know, I like the symmetry in the uh, in the allegory about the stone being alabaster stone and then the stone of the tomb. And, you know, uh, just to end, you know, in the in the Gospels, in the four Gospels, you have some women coming to the tomb to bring spices, right? And to anoint the body of Christ, which probably included spikenard, the same thing that was in the alabaster flask. And in those stories you have four different versions of which Marys are going to the tomb. In uh, Matthew, I think there are two, two Marys, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the mother of James. And the other ones, in, in St. John, you only have Mary Magdalene. And in, the, in the, the other two, you have either two or three people going. And so I think it's nice to think that there is some symmetry there. There might be two or three stories, and there might be a few different Marys going to the tomb, even though we know one of them was uh, you know, maybe not one of the people that broke the flask. So overall, we need to change our minds. We need to grow our hearts and our minds in a different way. We need to be able to soften our hearts, to, to, to sharpen our conscience, so that we can see God in every aspect. That means being silent and looking for Him, not ignoring Him when He's talking to us. Um, and when we see, you don't want to be like Judas, when you see something that doesn't make sense in the world, not saying this must not be God, but instead trying to find in your own heart where there's the problem, making them a tanya. Instead of trying to get God to change, we should change our own hearts. Anything you want to add to me? Any questions? Mm, glory be to God.